Pago, of course, who wrote this paper. He had entitled The Effects of Shape on the Interaction of Colloidal Particles. And, and I don't want to go into too much detail, but he was one of the first, I guess, or at least a, a landmark paper where he said that, you know, solutions of certain colloids, this is the blue underlined bit, uh, of highly asymmetrical particles, be it plates or rods, they uh, can form these anisotropic phases at very low volume fractions. And this can be explained on the basis of repulsive forces, so entropy only. So clearly shape has a, a massive impact on the behavior of these things. Um, now, Henk always used to make these sort of uh, notes, as they call them, as PhD students, uh, we would always get notes of various things on various topics. And I, here, I, just on the next slide, I stole one of, well, stole, I borrowed his picture, uh, which has the back of the envelope argument as to why you get the formation, in this case, of an isotropic uh, to a pneumatic transition for these, for these rods. And yeah, I mean, uh, it's kind of summarized here by what uh, Onsager wrote in these papers that this isotropic to pneumatic transition is driven by the loss of entropic uh, ent uh, orientation entropy and the gain of free volume entropy. And that's what Henk here uh, sketched quite nicely. I hope you can see my mouse. So if you go from the isotropic to the pneumatic phase, of course, you lose a lot of entropic degrees of freedom. So you lose a lot of orientational entropy. But what you gain is, of course, you gain a lot of entropy associated with the excluded volume, right? I mean, uh, if you're here compared to, say, uh, the excluded volume in the isotopic phase, you, you balance this loss of entropy, uh, orientational entropy. And if you basically do that and balance these two out, then you can really easily find on the back of the envelope that at some critical volume fraction or phi star, which is on the order of the diameter of the rod divided by the length, you go from an isotopic phase into a pneumatic phase. Now, this is just to illustrate that the shape of a particle, right, whether, you're, whether you have a sphere or whether you have a rod, really has a massive uh, impact on the behavior of, uh, of the suspension in this case. Now, the isotopic to pneumatic transition uh, has indeed also been seen, of course, also as I will show in a bit in molecular systems, but also very much in, uh, in colloidal liquid crystals. And um, so here I've just have a picture of this a schematic where you, if you take rods, which have an aspect ratio, so a length over a diameter, which is just larger than four, you get a whole series of liquid crystalline phases, uh, starting out with the isotropic phase at low packing fractions, and then you go into the pneumatic phase where all the rods line up, but there's no positional order. Now, Onsager explained this using basically excluded volume interactions only, and then also later Dan Frankel and others showed that if you increase the concentration further, uh, the pneumatic phase can go into a smectic phase where you get the formation of layers, but the order within the layer is still liquid-like. And if you keep going uh, with upping the concentration, you can also get things like uh, yeah, a crystal. Now, the nice thing of, for us to uh, study this in the colloidal systems is that we can actually see what's going on. And what do I mean with seeing them? Of course, colloidal particles, right, being on the order of a few nanometers to a few micrometers and being, because of their size, being quite slow, we can just see it in a, in a microscope. And I just brought two examples from the literature here. Uh, this is the first one where uh, the group of uh, Solomon, they made some PMMA ellipsoids. So they basically took PMMA spheres stretch them into thin ellipsoids where you get an aspect ratio of about 10. And then if you concentrate them a bit, as you can see in this confocal microscopy image here, they form sort of a colloidal pneumatic liquid crystal. Um, again, sort of these particles are, have a length of about six, five, six microns. Um, so this is an example of a colloidal liquid uh, crystal, a pneumatic liquid crystal. Um, I also have a picture here of a smectic liquid crystal made from colloidal silica rods in this case. So these are made in the group of uh, Alfons van Bladen and uh, Arnold Imhoff by Anke Kuyk, uh, also a famous paper from uh, about 10 years ago. And here you got a beautiful SEM picture of, um, of a smectic phase where you can clearly see the layers coming in. And this immediately also, as I said, tells us the advantage of looking at these uh, colloidal liquid crystals because they do similar phase behavior, but you can just see them at the particle level uh, with a simple optical microscope. Right, um, now, this is sort of the liquid crystalline things you can sort of see once you have uh, straight rods. And of course, these things are also relevant for you know, molecular liquid crystals, so thermotropic liquid crystals. I mean, this is, well, this slide could have been like 10 times longer, but the point is there's, there's many applications of liquid crystals. 
uh, you know, you've got here, like the top right here, you've got many molecules which have some roughly a, a rod-like shape. And they, of course, are super important for things like liquid crystal, ion, uh, liquid crystal displays um, and also yeah, liquid crystal films for biosensors. Why, why did I include the liquid crystal film for biosensors? Well, just because I, I read this paper here at the bottom right, and it just shows beautiful pictures, right? Beautiful colors, beautiful textures. Um, these liquid crystalline materials are also used for photonic materials, where sort of you get chirality induced superstructures. So the building blocks may be chiral, and you get all sorts of interesting structures. And also, this one I found more recently that, you know, in fruit, you can have these beautiful liquid crystalline cholesteric cellulose, which gives this beautiful shine, structural color to this uh, particular piece of fruit, which is just a few centimeters uh, big, but uh, it looks beautiful. And I think, yeah, that's supposed to be attracting of course birds in this case to eat it and spread the seeds inside i don't know i think i wouldn't eat it because it just looks too beautiful it looks like a gemstone to me but you know it's all down to sort of these liquid crystalline materials in the in the shell of these things now this <coughs> excuse me is um, you, you know when you think about rod shaped uh, molecules but of course you can also think about bent core molecules that's another class of molecules that exist and there are many of these this is just one example of which i don't even know the name um, but, you know, bent core molecules uh, are interesting because basically, rather than having one direction, yeah, the long axis that you would have in, uh, in a rod-like system here, you know, you have two directions now. So they're biaxial particles, or so biaxial molecules. So they've got a long axis N and they've got a polar axis uh, P. And because they're biaxial, you can make biaxial liquid crystals, so uh, liquid crystalline phases which have two uh, typical directors. Um, and this is very promising for, you know, switching devices, which are much faster than those um, built on uh, uniaxial particles, just because they can switch between two different axes. Again, they're also useful for photonic materials. And for us, they're also useful because they really show very rich phase behavior. Yeah, so this goes back to, to Onsago in the sense that shape has a massive effect on their behavior. And, you know, if you read this paper, this review paper here by Yakli et al. from a couple of years ago, but also the paper by uh, uh, Massi Chiappini, um, you know, who introduced this term. Uh, there's like tons of 50 new phases predicted and it's a real banana mania. And as I said, I didn't invent the term banana mania, so then Massi uses that in his paper. Um, but yeah, you can have beautiful and a whole zoo of these phases. Now, the point is that, okay, this is all good and well, uh, bent core molecules, you have all these, uh, all these liquid crystalline phases from, um, from bent core molecules, but it would be nice uh, to be able to look at this also from at the single particle level, uh, and therefore uh, using a colloidal banana shaped molecule of a, a, a colloidal banana shaped particle. The problem is, of course, we don't really have these colloidal bananas, right? And um, why am I telling you this story like this? Because this would be the safe way of, um, you know, the straightforward introduction and as to what the motivation for us was to develop these colloidal bananas, right? Um, and this would be viable. This would be perfectly fine. The problem is that this is not at all how we found these colloidal bananas, right? This couldn't be further from the truth, more or less. So what I'm just going to show you instead, rather than following the safe way, uh, I'm just going to show you the, the actual way. I'm just going to show you where did our path to colloidal bananas really start, because it didn't start with sort of bent core molecules at all. Yeah, we first had the colloidal bananas, and then we started looking back at what do bent core molecules actually do. So where did our path to colloidal bananas really start? Well, it started with the idea that we had of actively manipulating interfaces in colloidal systems, and in particular, colloidal liquid crystals. That's what we wanted to do. Um, and to put that a little bit in reality, I just, um, you know, bring back this phase diagram, as it were, with the isotropic, kinematic, cosmetic, and crystalline phases in, in rod-like colloidal systems. And of course, you have the bulk phases, but between them, you have all the interfaces, right? You have, let's focus on the isotropic, kinematic interface. So what we wanted to do, we wanted to actively manipulate using laser tweezers, optical laser tweezers, to manipulate the isotropic, kinematic interface, and thereby measuring this complex interfacial tension pull droplets off the interface, study droplet snap-off and coalescence. That was our goal. That's what we did. And, and this is illustrated here, uh, a paper we did a few years ago. Uh, but this is not a colloidal liquid crystalline system. This is a phase-separated colloid polymer mixture. So we have a colloidal liquid phase, 
the bright phase at the bottom, and we have a black phase, which is the colloidal gas phase at the top. And as you can see in the movie, we have two laser spots here, one here and one here. And we're actually actively lifting the liquid phase with a laser tweezer. And this is literally a Friday afternoon experiment where we bring these two laser spots together to get one perturbation of the interface. And from the shape of that interface perturbation, you can get the interfacial tension. And in a second, I'm actually letting go, uh, switching off the trap, and then the interface will relax. And then you can measure the capillary time and you can get the viscosity. So you can really measure interfacial properties from actively manipulating the interface. Now, the example I showed you here was a, a colloid polymer mixture. So uh, yeah, colloid a liquid gas uh, system. And we wanted to do this with a rod-like system. So what you need to be able to do this is you need a colloidal model system, of course, in our case, rods, and we need, uh, we need to be able to do confocal imaging and we need to be able to do optical tweezing. Now, if you put this all together and introduce rods instead of colloid polymer mixtures, then this would be the idea, right? So we have a nematic at the bottom and we have an isotropic at the top, and then we come in with our laser tweezers to actively deform this, this interface or even make small nematic droplets inside the isotropic phase which you then can bring together to actually induce coalescence while you monitor what's, for example, happening to the director fields. Um, and as I said, what we need is colloidal rods and we need confocal imaging and optical tweezing. Uh, the problem is that, um, I don't know who, who, for those of you who are familiar with confocal imaging, to do 3D confocal imaging, you need to make sure that you can actually image inside the bulk of your system. In other words, the refractive index of the particles needs to be very close and ideally the same as that of the solvent the particles are dispersed in, which means that the refractive index contrast delta n here has to be equal to zero to really achieve 3D imaging. The point now is that if you want to do optical tweezing, that's entirely based on scattering, right? And of course, if you have delta n is zero, you have no optical contrast, no scattering, no optical tweezing. So optical tweezing actually requires exactly the opposite. Uh, it requires an optical contrast. So delta n should not be zero. So the conclusion of this is that with having such an idea, I brought myself into a, a difficult problem because I have two contradictory needs. I need delta n is zero to do imaging. I need delta n is not equal to zero to do optical tweezing. So the solution to this is that you don't need to fulfill both conditions at the same time. You just want to have close to these conditions. You need a small optical contrast so you can do a little bit of confocal imaging deep enough and you can achieve optical tweezing, yeah? So we need, what we need in our systems, we need a tunable delta N, and it would be nice if you could tune the effect of gravity, i.e. you can tune the mass density difference between the particles and that of the solvent. So these are the real requirements, right? A tunable delta N and a tunable delta rho. So um, then uh, we went into the literature. You know, of course, there are many rod-like colloidal systems around, and you have the, the DMV or the FD virus or the bermite rods, and they all show nice uh, pneumatic phases. But the point is that they're very small, very thin. So if you come in with optical tweezers and try and trap an FD virus, it doesn't work because it doesn't have a large scattering volume at all. So these things are too small. Then you have, for example, the PMMA ellipsoids. So in principle, they're good because they have to, you know, you can match them and they can refractive index match and density match, I mean. But the point is that they don't really show very nice symmetric phases and to make them is a bit of a pain because you need to stretch these particles uh, the spherical particles and the yield uh, and the shape is just not ideal. Then uh, you've got the silica system, which was introduced in Utrecht, and those do very nice things. But the problem is that silica is very heavy. Yeah, so delta rho is very, very big, and the mass, because the mass density is, is, is large, you know, gravity plays a strong role. And ideally, we want to be closer to density matching and be able to control this. So we had this very good idea, but you know, and we have a laser tweezer and we have a confocal microscope, but we're just without suitable rods. Yeah, so we just said, okay, we need rods where we can tune the delta rho and delta n both close to zero. So this is, brings me to uh, sort of the outline of my talk. Um, the first part of the talk, I will actually talk about how we developed these rods, yeah, the rods that we need uh, with tunable delta rho and delta n. Uh, and these are colloidal SU8 polymer rods. And I'll show you how we make them and what we learned about them, uh, how we use them to do confocal microscopy and optical tweezing. And why do I show you these rods first? Because the rods were our way to finding uh, these bananas. 
Okay, so we made the rods, that was the purpose. Uh, and then basically by, well, not by accident, but you know, it's also not far off an accident. We sort of found these bananas. So this is why I'm telling you this story like this. Right, so let's start with uh, colloidal azuray polymer rods. So we were looking for these rods that we could refractive index match and density match. And of course, a, a polymer rod is a, is a good thing because they are usually quite light. And we did a Friday afternoon Google search and we, I just Googled polymer rods and we came up with this paper by Alagova here from Langmuir, like, a, you know, 2006 paper. And they used eschewate, which is a photoresin, a photoresist here. Um, and that doesn't really matter, but what mattered to us is that the refractive index of these particles was 1.6 of, sorry, the refractive index of eschewate was 1.6 and the mass density was 1.2. These are things which are achievable to match with uh, the right solvent combinations. Um, so what they did is they basically took a high uh, viscosity medium uh, like glycerol and just uh, squirted in some SU8 droplets and then would stir them like crazy. And then what would happen is that these droplets would elongate and you get very long, uh, long SU8 rods. So these are at least polymer rods, which are made of material that we can in principle refractive index and density match. The only thing is that the rods that they made, they are very big. Yeah, they're essentially a thermal or non-Brownian because that uh, their length is, you know, tens of microns. So it's definitely larger than 20 microns. And as you can see in the movie here, uh, I don't know if you can see if it's a movie. The point is that it is a movie, but it needs to show that the rods don't move very much. So not much is moving in this movie. Um, what we then did uh, on, in a similar style, like we did this on a Friday afternoon, because the synthesis is very easy, um, we thought, okay, what happens if we put these things in a sonicator? Yeah, and it was like, it was like we, we hit the magic button because we basically, once we put them in the sonicator, these things actually break. These very long non-browning rods, they break into lengths of about five micrometer long, diameter of about a half, which gives us an aspect ratio of just under 10, which is perfect. And as you can see in the movie at the bottom right here, they move, they are really Brownian. Yeah, so it took uh, almost a Friday afternoon to actually make Brownian uh, colloidal polymer rods made of su by but just sonicating them. Now this was great. Um, and then of course we checked, okay, you know, under the electron microscope, as you can see here at the top, these pictures, these are beautiful rods, very straight, sharp edges. They're just a little bit polydispersed uh, because of, well, actually they're very polydispersed because of the emulsion based method, but hey, you can't have it all. I mean, polydispersity doesn't necessarily stop these things forming uh, pneumatic phases. So that's the, the next thing we, we sort of verified and we, we made sort of samples at different concentrations by putting it on a slope. And then you can image at different parts of the sample and you get a concentration gradient. And indeed, we, you know, we did see isotropic phases at low uh, densities. We saw a pneumatic phase at intermediate densities. And we even saw, despite the polydispersity and length, we even saw smectic like structures forming. I mean, there's a little bit of fractionation uh, hidden underneath this, but these rods, they were, it showed us they're Brownian, they're polymer. We can see them in a confocal microscope and they do show the phase behavior that we want from them. Yeah, because we have isotropic pneumatic, if we put the sample vertically and let gravity go down, um, basically, then we can indeed make these nice interfaces, right? You have a pneumatic phase at the bottom here, we have an isotropic phase at the top, and we can image this with confocal microscopy. So the next step, of course, towards manipulating these interfaces is uh, bringing in optical tweezing. And, um, well, hold on, just one more thing, because uh, this was the imaging, uh, confocal imaging in, uh, in the plane, but we can actually really do it in 3D. If we put these things, these rods, in the right solvent, we can really get a full three-dimensional picture, as shown here, uh, from, in this case, the pneumatic phase. And we can even uh, track all the rods and find all their orientations. In other words, we have the full three-dimensional information on the structure and the dynamics. Uh, and that's, I don't think, has been done very often for pneumatic phases or even, yeah, smectic phases where you can tune the gravity and still find the coordinates of all of them. Right. Um, so finally, just a bit of optical tweezing because that's where we wanted to go. Well, the first experiment we did is, of course, trap a rod in water in this case. So we have two traps, one in the middle and one at the end, and we just spin it around. I don't think we particularly want to do anything with it, but, you know, we can tweeze them. The more interesting movie sits on the right here, where we actually have an isotropic phase of these rods. We put them in a solvent where the refractive index is small, 
but non-zero. So we can do confocal microscopy and come in with our laser tweezers. And what you're going to see along the diagonal, uh, there are going to be three optical traps. I'm just going to st stop this movie for now. We have three optical traps here, and we're going to concentrate uh, the isotropic phase. And what you can see is that this is the first time we really tried it. Now you can see the droplets forming here, here, and here. Yeah, and all the rods, they stand up along the optical axis, which is into the plane. And you are making these local pneumatic droplets inside an isotropic background. So this idea of making these droplets with these uh, optical tweezers while you image them with confocal is really working. Uh, of course, the point is that we, we blasted way too much laser power in here. We have a lot of convection. Uh, so it's far from ideal, but the proof principle is there that we can manipulate and image these things, these liquid crystals. Uh, at the same time with the rods that um, we develop, right? So I think we're on our way uh, towards trapping these interfaces and making these pneumatic droplets. And we did that using these colloidal SU8 rods, um, which have a tunable delta uh, mass density difference and a tunable refractive index difference. Now, why is this rod story important for, uh, for the bananas? Well, it is important because everything that we learned about using confocal microscopy and optical tweezing for eschewate rods immediately applies to uh, eschewate bananas. Okay, so once we had the bananas, we knew exactly what we needed to do to actually see them with a confocal. Okay, so this is why, uh, why it's important to show it that we learned a lot about how to deal with eschewate systems. And other than that, it's of course our way into bananas. So that's the, the last part, the next part of my talk and probably the main part, um, it's about these bananas. So first I'll show you how we made them and then I'll show you what they do, um, which are these two bullet points here. So how do we make them? Um, again, we start just like we started with Brownian and SU8 rods. We start with the Alagova protocol. We take glycerol, put SU8 in there, stay like hell and end up with these non-Brownian long SU8 rods. But then what uh, Carla did, uh, Carla is a PhD student uh, who's working, uh, yeah, working in my lab, working on these SU8 uh, systems, both rods and bananas and everything else. Um, what she did is rather than putting it in a sonicator, um, she put them in the oven. Yeah? She just heated them up. I didn't tell her to do this. This is something she did herself. So uh, you should never always ask everything to, on, to your supervisor. Sometimes you should just take initiative and do stuff. And I'm quite glad she did put them in the oven without asking me because, you know, what she came back with was a picture like this. I said, look what I got. I said, wow, what is this? Well, I knew what it was, but you know, how did you do this? What happened? Yeah, we start with these very long uh, non-Brownian rods, basically SU8 rods of 20, 30, 40 months. And then she put them in the oven and she comes back with a, with a picture that has spheres on it, it has sphero cylinders on it, it has bananas on it, bananas with different curvatures on it, and it has the original straight rods on it. So suddenly we have a whole library of azuate particles that we can make. And the cool thing is, of course, that as you can see from bananas one, two, three here, there is some, in, in some way we can control the curvature of these bananas. Now, now we can go back, right? Only then, once we saw the bananas, we started to ask ourselves, why are bananas cool? And I'm coming back to basically where I ended my introduction, you know, shape part two, because it's a biaxial particles, right? So these bananas break the cylindrical symmetry that the rod has, which has only one direction. Uh, and a banana is a biaxial particle, which has a long axis here, uh, indicated by this director N, and it has a polar orientation P. Now these biaxial particles, they can form chiral pneumatic phases and they can form biaxial pneumatic phases. And this is kind of funny and it's kind of interesting because this biaxial particle itself, for example, is not chiral, yet it can form chiral pneumatic phases. And that's shown here. I borrowed this picture uh, from, uh, well, from those of paper, but also from Massey's uh, PRL from last year, where, yeah, Two of these, I just want to show two examples of one of a chiral phase and one of a biaxial pneumatic. And here we've got a chiral phase, which is called the twist bent uh, pneumatic phase. And you can make this, as I said, without chiral particles. It's a little bit um, difficult to, to, to show, but what it really does is, if you think about this cylinder as sort of a hypothetical cylinder, these particles wrap themselves around it 
um, which means that the pneumatic director is always along uh, the vertical axis of this, uh, this cylinder. So you really have a pneumatic face. And um, because it can sort of go up as on sort of a circular staircase, left-handed or right-handed, you really have a chiral face. And that's a twist bent uh, pneumatic face. It's not a biaxial face, but it is a chiral face made of these bananas. The next example is the, is the splay bent pneumatic face, which is more of a planar structure. So here, rather than having a cylinder, I just have a plane here in the, in the, in the ZY plane. And what the bananas do here, they form this sort of bendy, wavy sinusoidal pattern uh, in the plane, which means that the long axis N is always pointed upwards, but the P vector, sort of the polar vector, is always perpendicular uh, to, the, to the long axis. So in the plane, you know, you've got basically a biaxial pneumatic phase with N going up and P either in this direction or in that direction. And this is a layer-wise structure. So the display band pneumatic phase, if you go up in height, then you will see the same structure repeating itself. So this is a biaxial pneumatic phase that actually has been predicted like uh, by Maya, like uh, 40 years ago and also Dozov worked on this, um, but it had never been seen uh, in an experiment to date. So, yeah, this kind of brings me back to, as I said, to, um, you know, to my introduction, you know, and these things, looking at pneumatic liquid crystals formed by these bent, uh, by these curved, um, yeah, these banana shaped particles is of course relevant because we have all these bent core molecules that do uh, show biaxial pneumatic phases are interesting for photonic materials. And also even in collaboration with Eric Dufresne, uh, they're putting some of our bananas on membranes, which is interesting. And for us, interesting is, of course, yeah, what do they do? What is their phase behavior? Um, and this brings me back to the banana mania that I uh, brought up earlier already. There's only one difference now. In the previous time I had this slide up, I said chloroid bananas question mark. Yeah, but now, of course, we have them, right? We have these chloroid bananas to look at these liquid crystalline phases at the particle scale. Right. So let me just show you uh, two stories now. Uh, how did we make them and how can we control their size and their shape, uh, their, their curvature in particular? And then finally, I'll show you what they do. So when we do the process, as I said, we stir them to get the very long rods and then we heat them uh, and then we get these uh, bananas. There's two key parameters in this process. First, you've got the delay time. And the delay time is the time between the synthesis, i.e. stirring very hard and putting them in the oven. And the second control parameter we have is the time they are actually in the oven, which we call the baking time here. Let's first look at the delay time. So the time between synthesis and heating. So what is the delay time doing? Um, well, the delay time is cross-linking. Okay, so when we make these rods, yeah, we stir very hard. You've got the SU8, but it's only very weakly cross-linked, if at all. And if we wait before we put them in the oven, it just turns out that the light in our fuel cupboard here in Oxford, you know, had, well, it wasn't great quality, which was our luck, to be honest, but it had a bit of UV light in it, of course. And what that UV light would do, it would do basically uh, cross-link this SU8 via this ring opening of these epoxy groups. And the longer you wait, the more cross-link these very long non-browning rods become. And we verified that by looking at the infrared spectrum here, where you can look at these typical epoxy peaks, which sort of disappear as you wait longer and longer, i.e. they disappear because you cross-link them as long as you keep them under the ambient light in the fume cupboard. And this was our luck, because if you look at the graph on the bottom right here, this is the intensity of these epoxy peaks as a function of time. And what you can see is that they disappear on the time scales of tens of minutes. Yeah, say up to an hour or, or something like that. Why is this important? Well, this is very important because if we put, if we would have put them under a very strong UV lamp, I would not be talking to you about bananas here because everything would be cross-linked in, in split second. Okay. If we would have had no light or no UV, I also wouldn't be talking about bananas here because they would never be cross-linked ever. Yeah, this makes no, maybe no sense now, but I'll show that in the next slide why this is important. Yeah, so we were lucky that it, it you know, the delay time basically allowed us to cross-link these particles on the time scales of tens of minutes. The question then, of course, comes what drives that shape transformation from a rod to a banana? And rather than explaining it, I'm just showing you the movie here. And this is a rod, and I'll show it again, the movie. This is a rod which has hardly been, uh, basically, we made it, and then we immediately put it in the oven. So the delay time 
In other words, the cross-linking time was very, very short. So what happens with this rod is that it just collapses to a sphere. Yeah, let me show the movie again. So you can just see it gets rounded edges at first and then it just collapses until you get a sphere. Done. And you see in the background, everything else is a sphere as well. So we took some uh, samples out during this process. Um, and it, yeah, you know, it takes about tens of minutes again. So here you can see um, after 10 minutes in the oven, what you can see, you still got the rods, but you have to note that the end of the rods are not sharp anymore. They're rounded now. And then if you wait a little bit longer, they started to collapse and you get this sort of cigar like sphere of cylinders. And then eventually if you wait long enough, everything collapses to a sphere. Now, if we increase the delay time a little bit, in other words, we wait a little bit longer before we put them in the oven. Yeah, the cross-linking density of the rods that you put in the oven is just a little bit higher. Then the following happens. So here's a confocal microscopy movie of what happens. You can see they start to get round edges and then poof, they actually buckle, they bend. This is how bananas are formed. And again, we can take out samples at different times and put them under the uh, confocal microscope and we see that they get a bit of round edges and they bend and they bend and then you've got bananas, right? And the final thing is what we did is of course, we waited for a very long time. We just left them in the fume cupboard and they are basically cross-linked for a long time, so long delay times. And then guess what happens? Well, nothing happens because they're fully cross-linked. Okay, you can put them in the oven. Uh, we took out the samples as a control experiment, but sharp edges and no shape transformation, anything, no shape deformation. So to rationalize this, you know, what we think is happening is that this is a competition of the heating temperature in the oven and the glass temperature of the SU-8, the glass transition temperature of the SU-8. So for short delay times, we say that the, the temperature in the oven is much larger than the glass temperature of the SU-8 because it's been hardly been cross-linked. So what you get is that it sort of liquefies as it were, you get the round edges and because of the Laplace pressure, this just collapses to a sphere. At very long delay times, I'm jumping to the graph at the bottom here, you know, it's fully cross-linked. So the glass temperature, uh, the temperature of the glass transition for the SU-8 has now been much, much higher than the temperature in the oven. So we can heat it to 90 degrees in this case, but you know, nothing is happening here. The interesting regimes, of course, when you go to intermediate or medium delay times where the cross-linking density is not low and not high. And in this situation, you've got basically the glass, temp the, the glass transition temperature being roughly similar, just uh, you know, just below the, the heating temperature or around the same. So what you get then is that the heat is enough to sort of get round edges of these things, but it's not, uh, the cross-linking is not so low that it fully collapses to a sphere. Yeah, so you get the Laplace pressure, but what you get then in the end, you get buckling here. Yeah, so, and because of this buckling, you, could, you get these bananas. And importantly, the particle volume in all these processes is totally conserved. Yeah, so it's not that these rods are breaking up, they're literally collapsing under the action of uh, buckling, or yeah, in this case, Laplace pressure to sphere, so depending on the delay time. So we can summarize this here in this morphological state diagram, i.e. controlling the curvature of these bananas, where on the horizontal axis here, I'm plotting delay time, which is, as I said, more or less a measure for the cross-linking density, on the vertical axis on the left hand side, I'm actually plotting the baking time, which is the time they spend in the oven. And on the right, it's not so re relevant for now, it's just the temperature. But the thing is that if you have zero baking time, i.e. you don't put them in the oven, of course you are, you get rots all the time. If you go to very large delay time, so full cross-linking on the right hand side here, they don't bend at all uh, and you just keep having rots. If I go to the other extreme of the horizontal axis here for very short delay time, so low cross-linking densities, these rods first collapse into sphere cylinders before they end up being spheres. Yeah, and if you wait a little bit longer, then of course the regime, um, it takes a bit longer before they actually go into the spheres regime. So you get a bit more uh, sphere cylinders. For intermediate delay times, it's interesting because that's where the banana regime sits. And depending on how long we cross-link them, i.e. for different delay times at the same baking time, that is how you control the curvature. 
Yeah, so for short delay times, they're more flexible, less cross-linked, and at the same baking time, they curve more than if you wait and you put a more cross-linked rod uh, in, the rod, uh, in the oven for the same amount of time. They do bend, but not by the same amount. So that's how you can control the curvature of these bananas. Yeah, and I'm just showing you three different curvatures here, and this is also the three different curvatures I will use to look at the phase behavior. Right, so this brings me to the last part of the talk. I don't know, I still have some time, I think. It's 10.40, so probably still have about 10 minutes or something. So this yeah, is it, it's, it's okay, it's okay. Yeah, I'm gonna finish it anyway. <laughs> and um, yeah, we're gonna look at the self-assembly of these differently curved bananas. So just to set the stage, so these are the same three pictures as I just showed. Uh, the typical length is ranging from say eight to 10 to 15, roughly 15 microns. The diameter is always um, you know, just under a micron, but importantly, the curvature here changes from, um, you know, 0.25 per micron to 0.10 to 0.08, and that is important. And the other thing that is important is that we've got polydispersed bananas, and we're going to look at this starting with system one, so the highly curved ones, and then we'll decrease the curvature. Right, so let's start with uh, the highly curved bananas here. Uh, what we did is we made samples at different packing fractions, and uh, the bottom left part of the, all these images here are just the plain confocal microscopy images. And the overlays at the top right is basically the same picture. Yeah, but here we colored the bananas according to the polar orientation as shown in the legend at the top right here. Okay, so the color just basically indicates the orientation of these bananas. And what we see is that for all the packing fractions that we measured here, these are pretty much isotropic structures all the way through. I mean, you get some local sort of, you know, ordering where they sort of stack up a little bit, but there's no, 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 no indication of any sort of pneumatic or longer range pneumatic smectic order. And this is also confirmed by looking at the distribution of these polar angles, right? As shown here, these for all, all different packing fractions, these are just flat. So, you know, pretty much an isotropic structure at all packing fractions for these highly curved and polydispersed uh, bananas. So, sorry, next we'll go to the slightly less curved banana, so system two, which has a curvature of 0.10 uh, per micrometer. And again, I'm showing you the four different backing fractions here with the confocal microscopy images bottom left and the overlay uh, where the particles are colored according to the polar orientations of the top right half of the image. So what we see at low packing fraction, again, it's an isotropic structure, but then in, in uh, panel B2 here, we already start seeing pneumatic structures, right? So the bananas line up in principle along their long axis. And you can see that uh, if you plot the polar vectors here, there's sort of two colors in here. So they're either like this or like that. Uh, but this means that sort of you have a, a pneumatic, actually a biaxial pneumatic phase because they're more or less in the plane. And it gets also even more interesting or exotic a little bit more if you go to very high packing fractions where we start seeing these smectic-like structure. So in B3, you got here a small, at the top right B3, I don't know if you can see my mouse, you've got a sort of a small domain of sort of polar smectic structures where uh, the layers are oriented in the same direction. In contrast to B4, where you can see beautiful layers of anti-polar smectic structures uh, where the bananas are sort of changed curvature, changed the direction of their curvature every, in every layer. So here they, I don't know, they, yeah, you could say they're all pointing in this direction, then here they're all pointing in that direction, and then in the other direction again. So that's a typical antipolar smectic structure at high packing fractions. And indeed you can see the pneumatic uh, structure and also the biaxial pneumatic structure for B2 by looking at the polar angle distribution because there are clearly two peaks in here which is then typical for the biaxial nature of this uh, pneumatic phase. Um, note that B3 here doesn't really show very clear peaks and that's because it's a polydomain structure, right? Um, so we have typically very small domains because of the polydispersity and also because of the long equilibration times. So it's often difficult for us to find very large field of views with very large domains. But uh, yeah, B4 was one of, one of the very nice uh, antipolar smectic uh, domains that we found in this system. So here we already start seeing some uh, quite nice liquid crystalline behavior, but the real interesting, the most interesting system that we studied was the third one, which is the lowest curvature that we looked at, 0.08. Um, and then, yeah, I just show you four images here as well. 
So at the low packing fraction again, it's isotropic. And then here at C2, we have this, the biopsonomatic phase, uh, like we've seen in the previous curvature. But the interesting bit comes actually here in panel C3, because here we start seeing a nematic phase where um, you know, the, the director field is very much modulated in space. So in C4, the highest packing fraction, we again see the sort of smectic uh, phases at very high packing fraction, again confirmed by these double peaks in, uh, in the polar angle distribution. But what is really the, the cool part here is that in C3 here, at this packing fraction, we see a strongly modulated pneumatic phase. And if you remember my picture of the smectic, of uh, the spray band pneumatic phase, that's one of the hallmarks of this play band pneumatic phase, that you've got a planar in the plane, very strong modulation of the local director field, of the local director, sorry, I should say it like that. Um, so let's have a look. Can we really say that this is play band pneumatic? Uh, well, not from just looking at it, we need to do a little bit more, um, because we need to distinguish two things. We need to look at the orientational order, so that's the, basically the, the orientation of the particles. So there should be a global pneumatic orientation. But on top of that, we need a spatial modulation of the local particle orientation. On top of that, because it's a pneumatic phase, we can't have any positional order. Yeah, we can't have any spatial modulation of the density like you would have in the smectic phase. In the smectic phase, you get clearly these layering. And if you plot the density profile across uh, a smectic phase, you get a clearly modulated density profile. So, to measure this, um, what we did is for each of the bananas, we were able to track the center of mass of the banana. Yeah, and we of course know uh, the direction of each banana. So from these positions, we can get the density profile later on. But of course, we not only need the positions, we also need the orientations. And that's what's shown uh, here. So here the particles are colored according to their long axis orientation. So this vector n here. And you can beautifully see, uh, it's a beautiful picture. You can yeah, see the waviness of the, the pattern. But the point is, we can measure both on the left-hand side, the position of the particles, and in the middle picture here, the orientation of the particles. So because we measure the orientation of the particles, we can get an average director for the, over the whole image. Yeah? So if we take an average of all these local orientations of the particle, then we know the average orientation, which is this solid, line here, the solid arrow here. So that's the average orientation is sort of the global pneumatic director. And we align our y-axis always along that uh, overall director. Okay. So what you want to do next then is you want to bin your, your system perpendicular to the global director. Yeah. So that's what these dashed lines show here. And per bin now, we can measure both the local direction of the orientations of the particles, and we can measure the density. And this solid, the solid, uh, solid wiggly line here, that's the density profile. And these white arrows are the orientations per bin. So we can really now look at the spatial modulation of the director field along the y-axis. And we can look at the, uh, the density modulation, so the spatial modulation of the density along the same thing. Yeah, so this is important to be able to distinguish and uh, quantify whether we have a, a spray band pneumatic phase. So I'll show you the same pictures, but now for a few more packing fractions, ranging from 0.6 to 0.79. And again, remember that the y-axis in each uh, picture is aligned along the global director, the overall pneumatic director. And then the solid line shows you the density profile and the local white line shows you the local, um, um, yeah, the local pneumatic director. Now let's start with the highest packing fraction. Um, so the first thing I note is that the density profile, albeit noisy, clearly has some structure in it, right? So you can see these peaks here for the different layers. And these peaks are more or less absent in all of the other lower packing fractions. So the highest packing fraction is the only packing fraction where we have a density modulation. And also from looking at it, we can just say that this is roughly then the smectic phase and not really a pneumatic phase anymore. The other ones don't have that. So these are all pneumatic phases on the four pictures on the left. Next, we need to look at the, the modulation of the director field of display band pneumatic phase. Uh, so here you've got sort of a cartoon of some of this play band pneumatic phase with N being that sort of director and the y-axis is uh, parallel to that. And then you want to measure this local 
pneumatic, uh, this local uh, director field as a function of y. Yeah, and this, if this is modulated, it's, it's more or less described by a sine wave and the sine wave have a given pitch length and it has a given amplitude. And the modulation of the director field for a splay band pneumatic phase is given by this equation here for the x component and the y component, it's the sine of the sine and a cosine of the sine, um, which as I just introduced, you have a, a given amplitude and you have a given pitch length. Okay. On top of that, in the splay band pneumatic phase, as was also shown by uh, Massi Giovini and Myla and Dextra here, is that in the splay band pneumatic phase, the amplitude is proportional to the pitch length and both of them decrease with increasing packing fraction. Okay, this is what they found in these computer simulations. So with this in mind, um, we uh, of course measured these uh, director fields and that's shown in the next picture here for all five of them. Uh, we showed the director field both uh, the Y component and the X component and we fit the measurement with this equation. Yeah, so we can perfectly well describe all of these director fields uh, with this equation. Um, and that's all good and well, but the point is, of course, um, you know, it doesn't really distinguish between, say, a smectic and a splay band and a pneumatic phase and, and a biaxial pneumatic. So it's not only the fact that we can describe it, what is more important is that from fitting these uh, data, we can measure, we can extract the pitch length and the amplitude. Yeah, so this is what we need to remember that in the splay band pneumatic phase, it shouldn't only be described by this equation, we also need to have that the amplitude is proportional to the pitch length and they both need to decrease with increasing packing fraction. And that's what's shown in this graph here. As a function of the packing fraction here, we, we plot the, the, the pitch length and we plot um, uh, the amplitude. And what you can see is basically that only for the higher packing fractions, the pitch length and the amplitude are proportional to each other and they both decrease with increasing packing fraction here. If we go from this packing fraction 0.67 to 0.64, we see that the, this trend is broken. Uh, yeah, one goes up, the other one goes down. And also they both sort of increase with increasing packing fraction on this end of the spectrum, right? So this means that uh, if we apply these sort of rules as it were, then we can say that on the left, this can't be a split band pneumatic phase because the pitch length and the amplitude increase here with increasing packing fraction. And at this point here, they also are not proportional to each other. However, for the two points that we have here, you know, we already know that this one is smectic. This fits the bill. Theta is proportional to P and they both decrease with increasing packing fraction. So this is, these are pictures here of this playband pneumatic phase, as I said, which was predicted over 40 years ago, but had never really been seen. Um, well, here are two pictures of them. And because we were so happy with this, of course, we uh, now make a slide with a uh, full uh, display band in its full glory. So here you can just see uh, yeah, the, the local director field with all the colors, a beautiful wavy spatially modulated director field. And we also verified that you could actually see it in 3D. So here you, on the right, you see a movie, um, a Z stack. So basically every image is uh, at a different height within the sample. And if you go high enough and then at some point you lose it, then you end up in the biaxial pneumatic and eventually you will get into uh, get into the isotropic phase. But on the bottom left here, you see a Z stack where you can see that even, you know, tens of, the, well, I think it's roughly 10 diameters or 15 diameters in, you can still have this beautiful uh, modulated director field, typical of the, uh, of the, of the split band pneumatic phase. So it doesn't only see it in 2D, but we also really see it in the third dimension. Right. I have one more slide to show and then um, I'm done because uh, Carla did not only put uh, rot in the oven, uh, she also then went on to do something else I didn't tell her to do, which is mixing things. Yeah, I told you that these bananas are very, very polydispersed and Carla thought they were not polydispersed enough yet. So she mixed bananas with different curvatures together. Yeah, and this gives us an extremely high polydispersity in curvature of over 60%. And you could ask yourself, okay, why is it interesting? Because usually polydispersity is a bit of a pain in the neck for colloids people, but polydispersity can also do really cool stuff. Because if you do this, what you get is you get things like this. Yeah, so you get that these bananas, they form what we sort of call vortices. Yeah, they, they self-assemble into these vortex-like super particles. Um, and the important thing is if you, if you color for the middle picture now, if you color this, vortex according, if you color the particle according to their curvature, 
what you see is that the most curved particles always sit in the middle and the outer ones are always the least curved particles. Yeah, so what you get is that this vortex liquid forms because of local curvature fractionation. Yeah, so polydispersity here actually gives rise to some interesting physics, some interesting self-assembly. And you can show that roughly the outer dimension of this vortex corresponds to the minimum curvature you have in your system. And the inner diameter of this uh, of the vortex are basically is basically corresponding to uh, the maximum curved rods uh, you have in your system. Yeah, so this curvature and this polydispersity and this size distribution really determines the geometrical properties, the sizes of these things, and leads to this uh, yeah quite exotic uh, self-assembly behavior. So this is still quite fresh, uh, and we're still working hard on this to uh, to see what it does for different packing fractions and different populations. But uh, it's clear to me that it's you know there's a lot to be seen with these these bananas and different polydispersities and curvatures. So with that, I come to the end, um, and I'll just let me summarize here. So I've shown you that we developed a new colloidal eschewate rod system with tunable and matchable uh, mass densities and refractive index contrast. Uh, with these systems, we could do simultaneous confocal microscopy and optical tweezing, which then immediately also means that we can do the same with our newly developed colloidal bananas, right? Because we can do it with the rods. The bananas are made of the same system. Um, yeah, we can do that for bananas with different curvature. We use the bananas with different curvatures to study their phase behavior. It's very rich. We've seen isotropic, biaxial pneumatics, polars, antipolar smectic phases, clay bands, and even these vortex liquids. And particularly the last thing shows that curvature and polydispersity are key factors for the self-assembly of these bananas. And uh, we are definitely not done studying them yet. Um, finally, I should like uh, to thank, of course, Carla, a PhD, brilliant PhD student in my group. Um, yeah, she's done amazing work and she will continue doing amazing work. So uh, thanks, Carla, for that. Um, so this work, there were um, uh, some other people, many more people were, of course, involved. So Massey from uh, Utrecht, who helped us analyzing the, uh, and finding uh, display band thematic phase, so analyzing the confocal microscopy images, together with Myelin, of course, so Taiki and Heidi in our group for making these bananas and with the rods and Aaron for the optical manipulation side of things. And some other people here, uh, Dirk, Louis, Adam, and yours for many useful uh, discussions. So if you want to read a bit more, so Carla, we published these papers here. The, rod, the first bit, the advanced materials, is about uh, the rods, and the other one is about uh, the bananas. And with that, I should like to thank the ESC for funding all this, and thank you for uh, listening. So that's it. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much for a fantastic uh, talk. Are there any questions? I'm sure there'll be some questions for the, from the audience. So please, if you want to ask a question, please put up your little blue hand, or if you don't know how to put up your little blue hand, just shout, but preferably put up your little blue hand. Questions, comments, praise, criticisms, anything. Who wants to be first? Oh, I have Margarida. Unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Now I think I have sound, okay? Yep, hello. Yep, yep, yep. we hear you. I'm still confused with all this technology, but thank you, Rule, for a beautiful talk. Thank you. I heard a little bit about it earlier, but it's so nice to see how it evolved. I have a really stupid question about size. Does the size of the rods you start with uh, matter at all? Or you just pick them because you can see them or the chemistry works better for these? I mean, uh, the yeah, size yeah. play any role or is it just curvature? Well, there is a little bit of size. So what is actually important is uh, a combination of size and curvature because it's the opening angle that is actually really relevant in these things. Okay. So I don't know, I didn't, I actually pulled it out of this, uh, of the sketch here, but um, yeah. I mean, you make a good point. I think it's, I think it might be in here. Yeah, you can oh, still- I saw, I saw the L now. Okay, okay, okay. So yeah. here we have it. So I removed it because I just didn't want to bore, uh, bring too many numbers in this slide. But you can see here that there is a length L and there is a radius of curvature here. And the angle, the opening angle is actually relevant here. So it's the combination of the curvature and the length that sets this opening angle. And the fact that the opening angle uh, was very, very big for these highly curved bananas. That's why they don't form long range structures because they basically 
they cannot stack uh, together because they, they are more than half closed, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, so you're right. It's definitely a combination of the two. Thank you, thank you. So um, you, you could still explore in applications and, and so on, different sizes, I mean, if you, if you yeah, could. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, the answer is just yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, nice work, yeah. Okay, next up we have a question from Lena. Lena, Lena, unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Thank you so much for a very, very nice talk. I only have a question is, uh, do you consider now the boundary conditions? Do you think it's important? Yeah, this is a very good point. So at this, at this stage, uh, you know, we, um, we didn't actually, uh, this is just bulk. Um, so we didn't really do very much, but of course it would be very interesting to, uh, to confine these things and uh, to play a little bit with the boundary conditions because they have to be very sensitive to the shape of the container that they're in. And this is also something that uh, uh, we've been doing here in the group with, uh, with our colleague uh, Gartz as well and one of his PhD students. Um, so yeah, that's definitely something you can do. I mean, there's all sorts of things you can do. I mean, you can also confine them not only in terms of uh, hard shapes, but also, for example, with uh, electric fields. Right, we haven't even put any sort of uh, fields uh, on this, and I think uh, you know that should also give rise to all sorts of things uh, that we haven't even explored. Okay. Thank you for uh, thank you for writing a very nice uh, Maria. <laughs> yes. Miko, Miko, you're next. Okay. Uh, thank you all. Very beautiful talk. Last question. Past slides about manipulating interfaces, colloidal liquid and colloidal gas. Is it yeah. possible to make interfaces between liquid of active colloids and vapor of active colloids? No, these are passive. They're not active colloids. No, I know, I know. But I'm asking if it is feasible for future to prepare. Oh, I see. Well, yeah. So I'm not very much. I'm not very much an expert in. Um, you know, in, in, in active colloids. The issue I think with active colloids is sometimes that sometimes they are having this metal, half metal coated things if you want to make some of these Janus particles. Um, I think metal is always difficult in optical tweezing, but let's say you don't have that. I think in principle, yes, you probably could. The, mat the, the matter of fact that is important is, is that um, the dense phase, yeah, so the density of the, uh, of the coexisting phases, whether they're active or not, the density, the packing fraction of the coexisting phases has to be very different from each other. You need to have a large coexistence gap to be able to do this because you rely on the optical contrast different between the two different phases. So if you're close to a critical point, in this case, it doesn't really work very well. And I think if you can achieve that with active colloids, then I don't see a reason why not, other than the details of the particles that you use. Thank you, thank you. Any more, any more questions, please? Any more questions? I have one, Paul. Who's that? Sorry? Igor. Igor, Igor go ahead. Yeah. Um, I would like to know if, uh, about this display band phase. If you, if you, in order to have this, do you need to, to have some, some dispersion on the curvature of the bananas? Because I would think that if I have perfect bananas with the same size and the same curvature, I would not, I, would, I don't think that they would see, I don't think that they would, they would fit in this wave shape. Yeah. This is a question that's more or less been addressed by uh, our colleagues in Utrecht, so uh, Mylan Dijkstra and uh, Massi Chiappini. Uh, they've shown that if you get very monodispersed bananas, right, the problem is that the smectic phase will totally dominate yeah, you get a very large smectic phase in your phase diagram. So you need a little bit of poly, well, at least polydispersity. Uh, oh, hold on, do I say that correctly? Well, let me put it correctly. I think polydispersity at least kills the smectic phase. So that helps you seeing display band thematic phase. I think it also wrote that um, the curvature itself, so maybe not the polydispersity, but I think the curvature itself in principle is enough to see display band thematic phase. Polydispersity helps, the curvature alone is in principle enough. Because if you have a smoothly curved banana, they can slide along each other, which is something that bent to boomerang shaped particles can't do. I'm not sure whether you need dispersity in the curvature to see its play bent. In fact, but I would 
have to reread Massey's uh, Am I Aligned paper. I think there okay. they address it. My gut feeling now is that they probably, they probably doesn't. It just needs smooth curvature and or poly dispersity. Okay, 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 thanks. Very good. Uh, do we have any more questions? I have one, if I can ask one. Yep, fire on. Um, so you just mentioned that it's probably impossible, well, regarding this active matter part, if you can use an external field to somehow give these particles a certain, let's say, um, intrinsic movement, which wouldn't be active matter according to some people in the field, but it would be according to many other people. So maybe you could use, yeah, some external field to induce a movement, yeah. Of particle, yeah. which would then lead to some kind of... Very good idea. I mean, there's just tons of things on our list and, uh, you know, I think we're teaming up with, uh, in this case, with uh, Denis Bartelot as well, um, who's of course an expert in active uh, active systems. And uh, yeah, we're working a bit with them, or or actually the other way. Well, it doesn't really matter, but we're sort of together with them. Uh, I think they also have an interest in uh, in sort of motorizing our, our our systems and see if we can make them mobile and see what happens then. And they would use external fields, as you said. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Okay, very good. Any more questions? Any more comments? Can, Any I just thank, uh, can I just thank Maria for writing a nice piece, a nice perspective on our paper? I think uh, you just asked the question, right, but I didn't actually... I thank you, it but it was really nice to do that, yes. Yeah. No, thanks for that, that's great. Right, very good. Now, looks like there are no more questions. So I'll just finish with a uh, very minor remark. Uh, I myself did a bit of work on um, these bent molecules many years ago, theory of the biaxial phase. Only back in those days, they weren't yet called bananas. The name had not yet become standard. So we called them boomerangs instead. Uh, this was just a, this was just a, a but I think we what we would call boomerangs is uh, I mean there is a silica system where all oh, oh, right and they don't have a smooth curvature. Okay, okay then. I, think, uh, I mean we actually comment on this and uh, I think that's also something that Massey and uh, Myerland wrote in their paper. If you get these boomerangs with no smooth curvature, they lock into smectic phases very easily because they can't slide past each other, which is very different when you have a continuous curvature. Oh, I see. That's that's and, that's uh, interesting. Yeah. And so the smectic phase is a lot more stable once you have these literal boomerangs compared to the, the uh, to the curved bananas. Well, curved right. bananas, that's a kind of uh, yeah. Well, anyway, but curved rods don't form the smectic that easily. So there is, I think, a, a bit of difference between uh, yeah a boomerang and a banana. Okay, so now we are getting into the realm of these very subtle differences that can have very um. Uh, remarkable consequences, like the difference—the difference between ellipsoids and 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 and, and spherical cylinders, that where um, oh, yeah. spherical cylinders can form a smectic phase and ellipsoids can't. That sort of uh, subtle detail, awesome. which is yeah, which may be subtle but is uh, nevertheless quite important. As oh, yeah. Lena, as as Lena uh, wrote mm -hmm. in the. Uh, title of her of her uh, of her piece are uh, the smallest details count. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. I think uh, I copy that. Right. Very good. So it seems there are no more questions, comments, or whatever. So uh, can we uh, thank Rul again? Thanks very much. Hartelijk yeah. bedankt, Rul. Yeah. Keep, up, keep, keep safe. Keep safe. Keep up the good work. Hopefully, so, uh, we'll see each other again soon, hopefully in person. If not, then on Zoom. Yeah, thank you very much for, for having me and uh, for listening. Yeah, it's great to talk to you. Yeah, thank you. And thank you all for coming. We'll be back with more in a week's yeah. time. There will be something on biological physics. Okay. Thanks. Thank Bye. You very much. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Krzysztof, on też i? No.
Right, so there's still uh, one or two people, or? No, let's, let, we'll, let's end the meeting. Yeah. I think you should, yeah, I think you should stop the taping or recording. Yes, yeah, so I'll stop it now. It's I'll kind of mute, I mean, even for the last two minutes or so. I'll stop it now.